everyone for coming to today's NREM seminar. Today's speaker is our own Dr. Philip Dixon. He's a university professor here at Iowa State in the Statistics Department. Philip received a Bachelor of Arts in Biology from the University of California at Berkeley and his Master's and PhD from Cornell University in Statistics and Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, respectively. Philip is also a recent recipient of the very prestigious Chartered Statistician Award from the Royal Statistic Statistical Society. His research, research interests are in developing and evaluating statistical methods to answer interesting biological questions. The themes of his research are using likelihood inference in non-standard situations and using computer-intensive methods. Philip's talk is titled, Things I Wish My Mother Had Taught Me, about statistics, that is. Please help me welcome Dr. Philip. Thanks, Brenna. Um, so what I'm going to do today is tell some stories. They're going to be relatively short, some a little longer than others. They're not going to be very technical, um, but they're going to be sort of distilling things, essentially, things that I've picked up over the 30-some years that I've been playing with data that I wish I'd known earlier, that nobody taught me. And for the graduate students in the audience, um, you think you've got your head torn open and we're pouring stuff into it, just wait. <laughs> because most of what I have learned, I have actually learned since I got my PhD about both ecology and statistics. So we'll see this list again. Um, and I promise you, I will mostly stay out of the weeds. Any of you recognize the plant? Right? No, velvet leaf. Um, we grow that in the agronomy farm in order to get the seeds to put into a weed demography study. They loved us. <laughs> So the first thing I'm going to talk about is something that's known in statistical literature as Simpson's paradox. It's one of these things that's commonly mentioned in some courses about categorical data analysis. And it's actually everywhere. And you probably don't know it by that name, but the concepts that underlie it are something you should at least be aware of. So here's the classic example. It's usually talked about in the context of aggregating data into a contingency table. So here are aggregated data. Um, this is probably the most famous example of Simpson's paradox. These are real numbers. Uh, dates back to UC Berkeley, a uh, little bit before I got there. Um, and if you look across graduate school admissions across the entire university, you see the percentages there. 44% of the men were admitted, 35% of the women were admitted to graduate school. That led to a lawsuit claiming that there was discrimination against women in graduate applications. Hmm. Certainly the admissions rate for women is lower. A science paper came out of this by some statisticians at Berkeley. And what they did was drill down into the data. And there are many more than six departments at Berkeley. These are just the numbers for the six largest departments. Anonymized. And so here are the admissions percentages for each one of the departments. And the ratio is men, to, women to men. 0.8 in the aggregate, 1.3, 1.0, nowhere, you know, maybe close to 0.8. But in the disaggregated data, you're seeing something very, very, very different. And no, nobody has fudged the numbers. These are both correct. Why? And this is Simpson's paradox. The aggregated data here tells a different story than the disaggregated data here. Why is that happening? Here's the common, um, or one way of showing what's commonly attributed to why there is a difference. Those six departments that I had before show different proportions of admissions for men and women. But that's not the only way that the departments differ. They differ also 
in how many applicants are women. And here are the two, two so I plotted both the men and the women, uh, sorry, uh, men and women acceptance rates on the y-axis against the proportion of women applicants in that department. Some departments get lots of women, and it doesn't matter what sex you are, the acceptance rate is low. Other departments get relatively few women. Um, this is 1970s. These are science and engineering departments. And the acceptance rate's a lot higher. In fact, the true story is being told by the disaggregated data, that when you aggregate the data, you're combining information about where women are applying to where um, the differential acceptance rate, and so that's why the aggregated data are misrepresenting the pattern. So, that's the classic example of um, Simpson's paradox. I'm going to give two more versions, and I'm going to use two species in one of my favorite mammalian orders, the Rhinogradentia. Um, this is the golden snout leaper. Um, there's the definitive monograph. Um, anatomy and biology of the rhinograts. Um, this is an amazing example of adaptive radiation on islands. Um, the ancestral, or the, the first uh, the clade, the root of the clade is assumed to be a shrew that out in the Pacific and has diversified into all sorts of uses for the noses, hence the rhinograts. So let's do a landscape scale. Um, habitat manipulation experiment. You might not work on the snouters, but you might do this sort of a study. Um, we do, basically, leaving aside all the details, um, we manipulate the habitat. We're attempting to increase the mass of these guys. Um, and the results are somewhat stressing. That, in fact, the treatment which was supposed to increase the mean body mass appears to decrease it. As in all examples of Simpson's paradox, there is something correlated with the groups that we have aggregated that helps drive the responses that we actually see. And in this example, that's a mix of age categories, juvenile and adults. And when you disaggregate the data, in fact, you see quite a marked change in um, effect of the treatment, which is all good. And what happened was that the sample that we obtained in the two areas actually had a different mix of ages. So that these oops, masses translate to an aggregate that misrepresents or might misrepresent the effect of the treatment. Third one, different species of snouter. This is the ear wing. It actually flies backwards. So there's the head. Um, the nose is used as a rudder. The ears are used to fly. Um, and you do a study, an observational study, where we're looking at the relationship between weight and ear length of the animals. And we're expecting to see a positive relationship. There are the data. 100 individuals from five islands. Negative correlation, which is not surprising given the data. These are actually one example of the sort of data that I put into my real easy to collect and are right paying for me to think about how to analyze. These are data on correlations where the data have structure. There are two sources of variability here. There's variability between islands. There's variability between individuals on an island. And nowhere biologically, ecologically, or any other subject matter logically is it said that those two have to behave in the same way. And in this case, they don't. Each color represents one of the islands. Within an island, you have a pattern that you expect to see, positive relationship, superimposed upon a trend between islands that's completely the other direction. One set of data, I want to look at correlation, what could be simpler? No, there are at least three different correlations that you could report. One place where there's some details. Um, many of you, if you've had 402 from me or somebody that uses this, the structure, have heard about variance components, which is a way of partitioning variability in an observation into multiple sources. When we're talking about correlations, 
we can actually do the same thing for covariances. We can actually partition two variables and the correlation between them into components so that we can observe the covariance variances and covariances, and covariances are related to correlations, um, between the observations, that's that pattern. We can look at the pooled pattern within each island, that's this piece, and we can look at the pattern between the means, that's that piece, and not surprisingly from the pictures, when you do the math, the observations have one correlation, the pattern between the islands has a different correlation and a very different sign from the individual level variability. Again, what you see in the aggregate, what you see here is in fact, the, the aggregated version here includes things that are interfering with what we might be wanting to look at, which might be the patterns within an island. So in any of these cases, which one do you want to report? I don't think there's an obvious answer. I think there are many different answers because there are many different questions that you could want to use these data for. And as long as you are aware of what you want to be looking at <coughs> and get it correctly from the data, then you're in good shape. The problem arises is when somebody just simply calculates the overall correlation, when that's not what they really want to be looking at. And so, if you were to try to describe the extant population, using the second example, you don't care about the age mix. You want to describe what you've seen. That's the aggregated version of the data. When you want to describe effects on comparable units, so same age individuals are on the same islands, that's a different answer. Where things get difficult to think about, require some thought, sometimes a beer, um, what happens when a treatment has multiple effects? So that the difference in the age structure is not just a nuisance, but it's actually a consequence of the treatment. When you say treatment effect, what do we mean? There are multiple answers to that. So, Simpson's paradox, I've come to find out, I've come to realize, is a lot more frequent and has consequences way beyond its classical archetypal example which appears in um, categorical data analysis. Second example, trust the computer, but verify. I don't know who the chap in the picture is. Uh, the quote comes from Edward Deming, um, who was a statistician, basically revolutionized Japanese manufacturing back in the 60s through the 80s. That's what a computer used to look like. Somebody like that. Um, this is actually a US picture. Fisher had a room like this at Rothamsted. Almost all women, because of the consequences of the First World War, but it was a room full of women, and in order to do a calculation, one woman would do one row or one part of the calculation, pass the paper on to the next woman in the line, who would verify the first row and do the second row. And by the end, we've inverted a matrix and gotten the stuff we need to do to do an analysis. Obviously, computing today is very, very different, and it's changed how I can do statistics. There are things that I can do now that I could only, couldn't even dream about trying to do to even 20 or 30 years ago, and were certainly almost impossible in that style of computing. So here's a data set from a grad student in plant pathology. Um, she was studying time to infection. I got involved because she came over to the consulting group and the student, the grad student said, I don't know what to do with these data. I did, so that's how I got involved. Um, she was studying how long it took different isolates of a pathogen to produce symptoms on different species of melons. So nice, <coughs> four or five different isolates, three different species of melon, Every day she'd go out, every morning she'd go out, walk through the greenhouse, look at which plants develop symptoms. So the response was the number of days between when she experimentally inoculated and when she noticed the plant, the symptoms. Most occurred between days 12 and 21, 
And all we know, because she only went out in the morning, is that it occurred sometime before, if, if she saw the symptoms on day 13, she knew that they occurred sometime between day 12 and day 13. Now, every time we measure something, we write it down in a rounded fashion or a coarsened fashion, right? Meter stick, or at least a portion of the meter stick, you measure a leaf length, you record it in millimeters, you probably get a tenth of a millimeter or a half of a millimeter. A tenth of a millimeter might be stretching it, but that's it. That's not the true length of the leaf. That's just what you recorded. So everything, whether it be a weight, length, any sort of measurement that I'm aware of will include some degree of coarsening. Do we ever talk about that? Do we ever worry about that? Never, usually. And that's because oftentimes the recording rounding is small relative to the size of the thing that we're looking at. It's half a centimeter on a two meter tall plant. We can ignore the coarseness. Well, in this case, the reporting interval is really coarse. Symptoms occurred between days 12 to 21. That's a 10 day span with a resolution of one day. Our coarsening is at the scale of a tenth, the total range of the observations. That's pretty coarse. And so that's not the only complication in these data. You can only keep these plants, apparently, so I'm, I'm not, I have to trust this student in this case, for 21 days. Something happens to them after that. So um, day 21, end of study. So there are some plants that are uninfected by day 21. They will probably develop symptoms sometime, but all we know is it's longer than 21. So in fact, what we have are two types of what is called sensory in the statistical literature. We have right sensory here, because the, the plants that are uninfected at the end of the study are right sensor, but we also have interval sensory when all we know is that an infection happens sometime between days 12 and 13. My experience from analyzing data where I ignore the coarsening versus when I actually account for the coarsening, when I treat the data as right sensor and interval sensor, which is just a different procedure in SAS or in R, um, is that it's almost always no problem. You can't do an analysis of variance, you've got to do something else, but that something else is, is well understood. So we did it. It's very computer intensive. I could not do it without the computer, whereas I could fit an analysis of variance if I had to by hand. And so we went ahead, told the computer to estimate the coefficients of those standard errors. This is an iterative process. The way these sorts of estimates are obtained is not by plugging things into a formula and calculating it. It's by calculating a trial value, seeing if I can do better. That's a new trial value, see if I can do better than that. And so the, what we're trying to do is to find the mountain in a fog. And we've got to look at, around our feet and decide whether we're at the top of the mountain. The computer has algorithms for deciding when it thinks it's converged. So, we analyzed this, it said it converged, we were happy. We got the coefficients we needed that described each of the treatment combinations that we wanted. We got standard errors, they were all nice and well behaved. We're all smiling. As is often the case when you're consulting, that was the first question. The second question was, could you average these 15 isolates? Because they're all one type of pathogen. So I want to know the average of these 15 and compare it to the average of those 15. And we said, no problem. We've got, we know how to do that. Just a pain to write out all the equations, but it's a, it's a well-defined computation. It turned out to be easier to take the SAS output, throw it into R, so we're using a mix of software. That's when we got a big red flag. Variances, squared deviations, average squared deviation, can be zero, small, or positive, but they're not supposed to be negative. And that's what the computer program told us. We got, oops. Now, 
We've got SAS code and a model. We've got our programs to take all that output and then do some subsequent calculations. There are lots of possibilities for error. So I look at my code. I look at the code. There's a student working in the consulting group who wrote it. He came to me and said, I got a problem. I said, yeah, we got a problem. I couldn't find a problem with the code. He couldn't find a problem with the code. He looked at it again. I looked at it again. We couldn't find a problem with the code. We finally, inspiration hit one of us, went back and looked in detail what we were getting, what was supposed to be the optimum. That's supposed to have certain characteristics. And those weren't true. If you care, we had a saddle point rather than a maximum. The computer thought it had converged. It hadn't. We needed the computer. We needed to trust the computer. But sometimes that trust was misplaced. In this case, it was actually a relatively easy fix. You can tell the computer to try hard. You have to use different words, but functionally, you can tell it to try hard. And when we told it to try harder, in fact, we got something where all the variances were positive. Does that mean I know that it's at the maximum? No, it just means I don't find any obvious problems. We were happy, the student was happy, I've got a story. This reminded me of something, just it sort of, it's a kick in the pants to me. Because worrying about computation and the quality of computation was something that was a regular part when computers were relatively new. It was something that 20 to 30 years ago, I had to do all the time. And nowadays, we sort of take it for granted. Well, trust the computer, but if there's a way to verify what you're doing, your life will probably be a little better. <coughs> third set of story, third story. Many core models can make good predictions. This is something where I couldn't even dream of doing this without a computer, for a, a, two levels at least. So here's a set of data. They're made up, uh, but they illustrate a pattern that I think is quite common in ecological data. One or two patterns commonly occurs. One is the data are all over the place. The variability swamps any sort of pattern. That's far too common in ecological data. But this is the other one, that there's no simple relationship. <clears throat> the noise is not very large, but the relationship between y and x is certainly not simple. It does not march up along this dirt line. So we got a model app. And I don't know about you, but I can't think of any sort of function, you know, quadratic cubic, sine curve, you know. I don't see it. Nowadays, there are at least two, it's actually a large class, of very flexible modelers, models, or modeling algorithms. Collectively, they go by the name of non-parametric regression. So regression without a model. Here are two of them. One that's called a smoothing spline, basically fits pieces of the data and allows the function that you're fitting to vary across the data and then stitches the pieces together in a way that makes some sense. The one I'm going to talk about is the one on the right, which is a classification of regression tree. Because I've got a quantitative response, this, is known as, this would be known as a classification tree. Instead of trying to make a smooth function, what a classification, uh, uh, a regression tree, excuse me, um, constructs is basically models the response, no matter what it is, simply by a sequence of straight lines, horizontal lines. So the value anywhere from x of about 1 to about just below 4 is modeled with a mean just shy of 3. So a sequence of straight lines with jumps in between them when we switch. As you can see, both of these do a reasonably good job of catching the major features of the data. The nice thing about a regression tree is that the class of the predictor here, the function that I stick in x and it kicks out y, is something that's extremely familiar to anybody who's had a taxonomy class. It's a dichotomous key. You start at the top. Is the x value less than 5.6? If it is, you go over on this side. If it isn't, you go over on that side. <coughs> What's relevant for our discussion today is that these subsequent branches and where a classification tree or regression tree gets a lot of its strength 
is that this branch here, looking at the difference between um, uh, six and a half, is estimated, is fit only to the pieces of the data that are larger than 5.6. Now in this case, I've talked one x variable and I'm chopping up the axis. But this could also be used for multiple x variables, different sorts of variables. So one consequence of rec what's uh, re repeatedly partitioning the data, and over on the left-hand side, the data gets partitioned in a lot of different times. So we look at whether it's less than 5.6, then is it less than 0.7 more or less? Each of these little subsets is being estimated and fit to increasingly small numbers of observations. Oops, jumped ahead of myself. So, as I was saying, sorry, back up one second. Because I'm repeatedly partitioning the data, I'm evaluating this split only on a subset of the observations, it means that a CART approach is exceedingly good at modeling what are called contingent relationships in the literature, which I suspect are everywhere in ecology. So here's a simple example of a contingent relationship. I've got the same pattern of green points, and I've got a second group of points that are the blue points. Below, what's that, about four? The two curves, the two sets of data are on top of each other. The, the color of the point is unimportant to predicting the level the y variable. Above four, all the blue points are a little bit below. But because the classifier will look at this stuff only in, or, or look at only the subset, say, above five or something like that, it can look at the effect of the color of the point completely separately in the two parts of the data. That's a contingent relationship. The color of the point makes no difference for small points and makes, large, uh, makes a difference for the large one. This is, in fact, the means coming from, predicted from, the cart tree fit to those data. <laughs> so we have color of the point matters for some, but not for others. If I knew exactly where that shift in behavior happened, right there at about five, I know how to model that because I just put an interaction term. I let the difference above five be different from the difference below five. With a cart tree, I didn't have to know that. I didn't even have to suspect that the effect was part of a contingent relationship. The data itself are telling me that I have something that that's, makes a difference for some observations, but not for others. By repeatedly partitioning the data, I naturally get a very easy way to detect these sort of Complicated, relatively complicated relationships. You don't get a free lunch. Um, the cost, statistically at least, of partitioning the data is that my decisions are based on increasingly small amounts of data. I started with 50 observations at the top. The first split, after I split, I have about sample sizes roughly in half. It doesn't always have to be half. And I didn't put the numbers down on the leaves, but for example, this leaf right here, there's a mean there that's estimated. That's done from two observations. That's not very much to estimate an average. And so I run up against something that happens a lot in sort of modern applications of statistics. There is a fundamental hard trade-off between bias and variance. Different model, I've drawn it as a line here. The green line is the truth. Just pick any one of those blue lines. We'll talk about the five of them in a second. I tried to fit a complicated relationship with a model that's too simple. Simple linear regression model. That might be useful. It tells me something about the data, but clearly I'm biased. I'm over-predicting down here, I'm under-predicting, I'm over-predicting. Here are five cart trees fit to different samples from the same true model. They all sort of track that pattern. The cart tree is not biased, the regression is. But the um, flip side of a flexible modeler and a consequence of repeatedly partitioning the data 
is that my predictions, my model that I estimate for the part tree is more variable. And that's where this, these, the fact that there are five lines, five different samples of data, each fit to a cart tree. Just look at the variability, different samples, quite a bit more variability than there is in the simple model. This is the bias variance trade-off. I can fit a more flexible model, I reduce the bias, but I'm gaining variance between different samples of the data. I want to reduce that. I'd like to have something that really tracks the truth and does so very, very closely every time. How do we do it? My standard answer, go work harder. Go out and get some more data. That's probably the most common answer, common thing we say in the consulting group, is you need more data. That certainly works. Often that's not. That's just out of the question. One possibility is don't split so much. Don't go so, don't grow a tree that's so large. Stay up higher in the tree. That certainly gives me more, less variable predictions, but it's more biased. It's, it's not as flexible. The modern idea, and this is an idea that goes back only about 20 years now, is, well, a, 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 is going to be a variation on the third idea here, which is go repeat study. So just to ground something we're going to see in a second, Conceptually, you could imagine if you're trying to make a prediction from five observations, you could go do, collect a set of data, make a prediction from five observations, collect a second set of data, repeat the study, get another set of prediction from five, do that a whole bunch of times, make a prediction from each of those studies, and then average the predictions. Again, that's more work, but we'll see how we can get the computer to do that for us. <clears throat> Notice that this idea of averaging multiple studies only works for a model that's unbiased. Those are five data sets from the green model, from the truth, and I fit a straight line to each one of them. The variability is low, but I've not gotten rid of the bias. If I average, pick an X and average, doesn't matter whether I'm there or there, I'm still biased. So all of this averaging idea only works when I have an unbiased prediction. So I've only got one study. It's taken me three years. Nobody else is going to repeat the study. Here's how I can gin up multiple studies. It's an idea called the bootstrap. We emulate multiple studies by resampling the data. We go back in and this point might not be in my bootstrap data set. That one might be in twice. I, I draw, or I resample my observations. The standard application is to estimate confidence intervals for difficult statistics. None, the usual stuff doesn't work. I resample the data and I can calculate confidence intervals. What is known as bootstrap aggregation or bagging is to do this by averaging the predictions. I'm not coming up with a confidence interval. I'm simply repeating all of this to get multiple predictions from similar data sets that I then proceed to average. I need a computer to calculate, to fit the original cart tree. I need the computer a lot to do this a thousand times. Oops. To motivate something, one of the other last little details, reminder of the variance of the mean, you're used to seeing a formula like that, variance divided by the sample size. That assumes the observations are independent. When there's a correlation between estimates, say, from two studies, then the variance of the mean is slightly larger, and it depends on the correlation. This plot illustrates that. If you imagine data that are, imagine a whole bunch of observations from lots of studies, if the correlation is one, so every study is giving me the same answer, then I don't reduce the variability at all. I get the most improvement, the most reduction in variability, the least spread when the correlation is zero. And in fact, if I could go negative, I'd get even better, but that's usually impractical. <coughs> and something in between, like a half, gets me <coughs> roughly half the way in between. So when I'm doing this bootstrapping, 
reducing co the correlation, because remember, I'm starting with the same data set. I'm drawing a sample from it to get my bootstrap data. Anything I can do to reduce the correlation between different data sets is going to move me from here down to there, and I'm going to get more improvement, a better, a more precise estimate from the same number of computer hours. So here's the radical idea. Throw away data. Each time I bootstrap, not only resample the observations, but also throw away some of the variables. So for example, first sample, if I had seven variables, I might use only three of them, the first, the third, and the seventh. Second model, I might use three, two different ones. Resample the variables every time. The consequence of this, because I'm using different variables, is actually I reduce that correlation between different samples. I'm moving from here, or somewhere in between here, down and over towards here. Sure, each sample, less precise predictions, but because I don't care about the first bootstrap sample, that's just too long a way to calculate an average, I get a more precise average. And that's the bagging idea. The whole general idea, the whole class of methods are called ensemble <coughs> predictors. The extension of CART. And the folks who've done a lot of this work have a penchant for cute names. Because we have a collection of trees, what does that make but a forest? So this is called the random forest predictor. Does it actually work? Um, we've got another name, but for here I'll call it, in public I'll call it the evasives team and smiley. Um, Jan Thompson, Mark Wordelector, and Kapler are over there. Um, the, the basic question is to ask, will a woody plant that's introduced to Iowa and naturalize? Horticultural trade wants to introduce plants. That's how they, you know, everybody likes something new and novel. Nobody really likes it when your nice novel plant starts growing out in the woods. So naturalizing is not good. That's ideally would be a decision that's made before the plant is allowed to be introduced and grown in the United States. So we're trying to predict. We have a bunch of biological and geographical information about species. Um, in our case, uh, Mark, you were the one who actually figured out who the candidate species were. Um, 129 species of woody plants that are known to be introduced into Iowa. We can go out and ask whether they've naturalized. We're going to use 100 species to develop the model and then assess whether or not it um, predicts correctly or poorly on the remaining 29. We've done, we've fit a variety of different models. We've worked on various, we've got like four papers and hopefully we'll soon, we'll shortly get a fifth out the door. Um, if we fit and we look at the biologically significant error rate. This is for the species that are known to naturalize. If I make an error, I make an error by saying that one's safe. It will not naturalize. I predict it not to naturalize, but the reality is it does. That's a bad error. That's the rate that we really care about. Current model, just one tree fit to the data, gets 16% error, more or less. The random forest cuts that to 4%. So, Empirically, random <laughs> forests work really well for this problem. In fact, common wisdom is that random forests are probably the best out-of-the-box predictor where you don't have knowledge, where you don't have any sort of biological information to help form the model across a wide variety of applications. Last two topics, uh, context is going to be a particular one study. Um, this was a a master's and then PhD project of a student in statistics, Alan Trapp, who did most of the work. And what we're modeling is seed germinability and long-term storage. You may be aware, you've probably seen the cages, may not have realized what they are, out by the plant introduction station. Um, they are a germplasm storage facility. They, they maintain germplasm of a variety of different species and varieties in case that germplasm is needed in the future. So you've got metal racks filled with gallon jars of seed. 6,000 some maize seed lots 
stored here in Ames. Unfortunately, you put a plant, you put seeds, they're still alive. They lose germinability over time. Eventually, you have to plant out a collection, that's what the cages are for, and regenerate the seed lot. Because if the germinability goes below too low, you start getting genetic drift, you start losing seeds, you can imagine all sorts of not, not good things. So what we want to do is to predict when the germination drops below a particular value. And if we were to sample the seed every year, it's pretty easy to see. We could track it closely. That's expensive, growing out the seeds. It's expensive because you, lose, you use seeds in order to test the germinability. So you don't want to do this too often. So you do it every now and then. And sometimes you get stung. And Mark came to me and said, oh, we've got data like this. Can we predict when it's going to cross over a threshold? And that might suggest we're going to go sample this blue lot sometime maybe around 25 years from harvest and then decide whether or not to regenerate it before it crosses over the threshold. We need a model that's going to account for a variety of observed patterns. There are some lots, this is all of maize data, there are some that maintain basically 100% or close to 100% germinability for a long time. There are some which start out at 100% and drop, and although the symbols, the after right being the circles, there are some where the germination actually increases or the apparent germination increases over time and then drops off. These are going to have to be fit to a relatively small number of observations for each seed lot. In some cases, as few as three. That limits the complexity of the model. So we chose a set of quadratics to try to model that. So we have in excess of 2,800 seed lots. We want to make a prediction for each one. We could fit a quadratic, estimate the coefficients. But should you do that? Fit a quadratic to three points. It's going to go through exactly those points. We're modeling the noise. That's maybe the pattern as well, but we're mostly modeling the noise. Again, because of computing, I'm relying on the computer, you can tell, it's possible to borrow information from <coughs> multiple seed lots. So we let each seed lot represent something common, that's the betas, and then something that's seed lot specific that are tied together by being essentially random effects for each seed lot. And when I have random effects, I can estimate or actually predict this whole quantity here by something that's called a blop, best linear unbiased predictor. And blops can be really, really helpful in a lot of problems, and we don't teach much about them in, unless you get to the relatively advanced linear, method, uh, linear models classes. But they can be really helpful. Let me show you. Here's the, one of these very simple examples of a blop. This is baseball players. I believe these are the Cleveland Indians in 1970. Uh, Roberto Clemente, some people may remember him. Very well known, very good. So these are the batting performances, the batting average for the first 45 bats at bats of 15 players on the Cleveland Indians. Some are good, some are not so good. That's the beginning of the season. What we want to do is to predict what they will do in the second half of the season. <coughs> the batting average in the first half of the season could be used to predict the second half of the season, but notice the pattern. Roberto Clemente is, would be the best, and in fact, here are the real data. He is still the best, but he's not as good as he appears to be at the beginning of the season. Alvis is still the worst of these 15, but not quite so bad. What's happening is Roberto Clemente is good, so there is some skill level in the ordering here, but there's also a luck factor. The skill is repeatable, the luck is not. So some of these, or shouldn't be, if you can bottle that, I'll take it. <laughs> um, some of these people are up here on the top. I think Robinson is one. 
who looks like they got moderately lucky, and some of these others really draw. Okay? That's the non-repeatability of the luck. So the number that we would use to describe the behavior at the beginning of the season is not a very good predictor of what's going to happen in the future. If we shrink the observations, pull everybody down towards the mean, so the, top, the guys with the high averages stay high but not quite so high, the low averages stay low but not quite so low. In fact, the errors in making predictions are much smaller for these bluffs, for these shrunken values, than they are if I just simply extrapolate the past. What I've done, what a bluff does, is remove the luck factor. I'll skip that in the interest of time. Does this actually work? You can valid, you can check it by simulating some data. Um, this is basically um, comparing, generating a set of data, comparing a model where I just literally fit a quadratic for each C block, and then I fit this random effects. And what I'm going to try to do, the data go out to 26 years, I'm going to predict it 30 years, and again at 40 years. So here are the root mean squared error of prediction, basically standard deviation of predictions, going out three years, uh, sorry, for seed lots with three observations, four observations, and five observations, predicting at 30 years, predicting at 40 years. Doesn't matter which type of prediction you want to look at. You're way better. Sometimes a third sometimes a tenth better using this shrunken thing to predict the future than you are simply modeling the fixed effect. What makes this work is that these are averaged over all seed lots. There are some seed lots where the bluff does worse, but averaged over all seed lots, knowing something about random effects and predicting random effects can give you predictions that are much, much, much closer to what's actually observed, in what the truth was, and this is simulated data, than simply fitting quadratic curves. And the last story will be relatively short. Reverend Bayes can be your friend. Uh, Reverend Bayes refers to Bayes' theorem, and more generally, Bayesian statistics, which is a way now of a numerical revolution happened in the early 90s, and it has very, very much um, changed how uh, the options we have for working with both simple and complicated problems. I was modeling germination at age. What I really want to know is when it's going to, when this seed lot here, the red one, is going to cross the threshold. And there's some uncertainty on that. The blue lines are the uncertainty around the curve, and they translate into uncertainty in when this particular seed lot is going to cross, in this case, a 50% threshold. That's a nonlinear problem. It turns out it's a root of a quadratic equation. Nonlinear problems generally are nasty problems. You could calculate it if you got the estimates, but what that does, reporting the number you get from the estimates, is implicitly assuming the cost of being too high is equal to the cost of being too low. We don't think about costs and losses and decisions very much, unless you're dealing with statistical decision theory. But in this case, the costs are most definitely not the same. If we predict too low, so we say, there's the truth, but I'm going to predict five years earlier, basically the folks at the Planet Introduction Center station test the seed before they have to. The cost is a test. If we predict too high, so I don't think it's going to cross the threshold till 55 years, and at 55 years, we're in trouble, you lose the seed line. <clears throat> what that means is we're going to want to skew our prediction sort of on the early side. And that means getting a distribution of times the threshold, something like this. And then instead of predicting the average, we'll say, OK, you might want to predict somewhere down here, something in the, say, the 15th or the 20th percentile. Calculating this guy is the hard part. 
The first version that we came up with was something called a parametric bootstrap. That took about 20, 30 hours on a computer. Doable, it's not an overnight, it's a weekend computation. Gave a seminar on this, talked about this, and one of the people in the audience said, well, why don't you do a Bayesian analysis? That turned out to be very easy to do, and less than an hour of computing. It's not trivial, but that means, um, and that's for 2,800 plus C blocks. So no matter what you feel like philosophically about Bayesian statistics, you can end up with um, often getting what you want for complicated problems much more easily out of a Bayesian analysis than you can out of a non-Bayesian analysis. So, be nice if environmental data gave us an obvious pattern. Right? You can look at that and you know exactly what's going on. I hope. That's somewhere in eastern Iowa, sunset. One of my favorite painters is Turner, British romantic slash impressionist, um, early 1800s. This is sunset over a lake. This is my metaphor for ecological data. <laughs> there is a pattern here. You might be able to see the sun. And if you look at it hard enough, especially if you know there's supposed to be a lake here, you can sort of see the lake. But you've got to work at figuring out what's happening. This is where statistics can help you. And what I've tried to share today are five sort of individual little stories of things that may make your life easier or suggest new ways of doing something that you might not have thought about before to figure out what's going on in interesting things. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer questions. Pirates? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, 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 I just demonstrated my lack of knowledge about baseball. And to any Pittsburgh fan, I profusely apologize. So there's ways to, to model or to estimate parameters that are kind of equivalent of best linear unbiased predictors in a Bayesian framework using hierarchical models. I was wondering if you talk about if that would be you know, if there's a framework where you could use either the way, if there would be an advantage using Bayesian methods, or if there would be essentially the same thing? Um, in many cases, Bayesian methods can be made to reconstruct traditional frequency documents, which is why I don't get all heated up about learning the correct definition of a competency. Um, this has nothing to do with hierarchical models. Oftentimes we think of hierarchical models and Bayesian statistics in one phrase. And that's because in many hierarchical models you need Bayesian analysis in order to fit and do what you need to do. But if, if it's simple enough, modeled with all normals everywhere in sight, there's a likelihood analysis. Um, so the question really is, can you get something like a, a block from Bayesian analysis? And the answer is very definitely because everything's a random variable. And so it's just taking a what's called the posterior distribution that Adam that showed, and then deciding what you want to calculate from that as your estimate. Best just means a certain class of something. <coughs> um, I've not actually sat down and worked out the details, but I imagine you could, you could get a block from a Bayesian analysis, or you could get the median of the posterior, or the mean of the posterior, whatever else you'd like. So um, the answer is yes, without going into any details. Yeah, Brent. I like the Simpsons paradox a lot. I think it's really common. How much of the, uh, there's a controversy you know, about reproducibility, like somebody does a study and then somebody else does a study and they find a different results. How much of the reproduce, unreproducibility that's out there do you think is because of the Simpsons paradox? They study things at different scales, they combine, they don't combine things. So there's a huge push now. There's a, there's a guy now back in Greece by the name of Ioannidis who's made a career out of publishing papers where the title is something like 
90% of results in, it's in cardiac surgery, it goes into a cardiac surgery journal and the title has cardiac surgery in it. It goes into the hematology literature. He's, that's his life. Um, 90% of all published results are wrong. And this is the idea of reproducibility. Um, I don't, it doesn't have to have anything to do with the Simpson's paradox. Right? If you've got uh, a late variable, something like the age distribution, which is varying between studies, it could certainly lead to different results. But I don't think there are, there are other reasons why things might not be reproducible, completely aside of Simpson's paradox. That would be just one way you could get that. So I, you know, you'd have to go, you'd have to know a literature, you'd have to look at places where people have actually repeated studies. And that's why most of INID's examples are in the human health literature, because that's where people repeat studies. Um, if you spent four years studying the prairie, not too many other people are going to come out and spend another four years studying the prairie. Um, so I don't know the answer specifically how much of the uh, non-reproducibility to the Simpsons paradox. Chris? I'm not sure if you can answer this question. Uh, but I'm you can ask it. I'm going to ask it, exactly. That's what I can do. So with your example of looking at the bootstrap results versus the Bayesian results, uh, you had the benefit of hindsight to, to, to be able to say, hey, the Bayesian approach was more efficient, right? It took us an hour versus the 20. Uh, I, I guess when you're looking ahead, you know, we all know that there's multiple ways that you can address a question and analyze data. Uh, I guess in, in your view, are there certain situations where you would choose right off the bat a Bayesian approach to address a problem? Um, that's a loaded question. <laughs> <laughs> And my answer today will be different than the answer that I would have given you five years ago. Um, I'm much more willing to do Bayesian analysis now. Partly it depends on who I'm working with and what, where they're going to try to publish the results. Um, some of you may know, you may be interested, we now offer a 400 level base class. You got to have some math stat background in order to, so that, that stuff makes sense. So it's got a little bit more prereq. Um, one of the students in EEB took that um, and told me that she'd been talking up the Bayesian methods amongst her colleagues, which is an international collaboration, and they don't like them. There's some intellectual baggage that historically was associated with Bayes that this, this is a very short version of a very long, usually helped by a beer, conversation. Um, and that intellectual baggage means some people just don't like it. Bayesian analyses. As I said to Eric's question, um, oftentimes you get exactly the same results. So I don't see what the, the hot air is all about. Um, but yeah, if it's complicated, there are often ways of getting a Bayesian model to A fit and give you interesting results that are really hard from something else. So if you know up front that a uh, uh, the problem is going to be pretty computationally intensive and pretty difficult, and you have a choice between the bootstrap or Bayesian, would your instinct draw you to do a Bayesian sort of analysis at the first pass? Let's try to get you to commit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on quicksand. <laughs> um, maybe. Most <laughs> that for straddling the fence. I see. Right? I see. There was a, there's a joke that, that Somebody wants, they said it, I think, about economists, but it applies equally well to statisticians. Somebody wants a one-handed statistician, because I'm far too fond of saying, on the other hand. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm definitely straddling the fence. You maneuvered that very, very deftly, so thank you. <laughs> I, I'm going to turn the question around. Right? You produce analyses for wildlife managers. You, you produce analyses that are going to be turned into Decisions on the ground. Yes. What's your take? So, my take. I mean, I, my first impression is I'm I'm going to use the the simplest analysis to get to the potential answer to the question, right? Um, 
I guess it would depend on the situation. Um, if, if the if there was readily available, if I, I would if I knew how to do it in a Bayesian context, and it was relatively straightforward, I'd probably do that. And then if the answer to that analysis was perhaps questionable, I might try it a different way and make sure that you know the direction of the answer is in the same you know, same general. And I concur with that. That it's basically what can oftentimes I have to get an answer relatively quickly. Yeah, exactly. And so and if so I can compute the frequentist, you know, I can drop it into SAS and get an answer. Yeah, I'll do that. It's interesting because some of the limitations are own knowledge, right? We're, we're kind of you know biased against what we know and what we don't know. So you know it's, it's, that plays into many answers to one simple question. Well, that's all of our time for today. I'm sure if anyone else has any more questions, Phil would be happy to answer them after the I can't run away. <laughs> I can't fly home. But thank you all for coming, and thank you, Phil, for the great talk. Uh, we will be taking a break um, in the next two weeks for Thanksgiving break. But uh, December 5th, we'll have a graduate student poster session. So I hope you all will attend that. Okay.